<laughs> oh, Father, guess why? 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 Who cares, though? Parce que c'est un dream come true aujourd'hui. Yeah. Bobby Sullivan. Yeah. Avant Taichka. Bobby, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, sir, man. Un des combats les plus épiques de l'histoire de TKO. Puis on est les deux gars avec nous. Direct là. What's up, tout le monde? Bienvenue au Pas de Je suis tellement content. C'est longtemps qu'on l'attendait. Je sais pas si on en a fou le parler on camera. Mais off camera, on parlait tout le temps du fait qu'on voulait recevoir Bobby Sullivan. C'est un combat épique. Puis gardez, on perdra pas fou de temps avec ça. Mais c'est ça qu'on veut faire. Bobby Sullivan, bloody Bobby. Thank you for being here, man. We're yeah. so happy to we're have so you. We're so happy. Like, off, uh, off camera and all that, we were always talking like, we're so anxious to get like, Bobby Sullivan on the podcast. And we're so... We're so grateful, like you're in like your last 24 hours, like it's crunch time and you're taking time to do this, man. It's really, really appreciated. Oh, no problem, guys. I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to talk to both of you. Uh, you know, I've had a couple uh, great conversations with you, Adam, and me and Faber had a great afternoon here talking and, uh, you know, just really get to know each other. Uh, I'm really excited what you guys have been doing here. Your podcast is fantastic. Thank always you, uh, always entertaining. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to jump into this with a, with a little question. Uh, the the guys on Fight Network were calling you Bloody Bobby. Yes. Do you like that name or? Yeah, you know what? I, I enjoyed it. I think it, it works pretty well. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of passion for it. And it seems like a lot of people were catching on with it. So I'm rolling with it. Oh, man. I find it so badass. Like, Bloody <laughs> Bobby and uh, Bobby Knuckles. You know, it's like yeah. two of the most badass <laughs> names in MMA for real, man. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. And, and, then, and then a lot of people don't like the, the like, their, their names that they get in given to them and all that yeah. so uh, it's cool that you like well you know what? i've played sports my whole life right and i've never really had a name that stuck i mean i mean last name sullivan so people always call me sully right but you know there was never really a, a name that stuck right so it was cool to have something you know organic come up like that and have robin just shout it out and it, it really stuck and you know i'm enjoying it and all you know right. people are, it's really catching on with people and uh yeah it's, like you said it's pretty badass yeah it is badass uh, and uh, did they did he present you uh, as bloody bobby in the at the weigh-ins and all that or Um, I, I don't really, I'm not really sure. I don't think they, uh, they said my nickname. Well, try, or try to, try to. Yeah, I got to talk to Patrick. Oh, yeah, so, so, to Patrick. so tomorrow, you got to, you got to plug it in. Yeah. Man. It's crazy. Oh, man. I, yeah, I got, uh, my intro songs working with the whole bloody thing, too. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, right, I'm, right. yeah, I'm pretty pumped up for it. Oh, yeah. oh just uh, rapidement, dans le fond, Adam, il a demandé le surnom Bloody Bobby euh, pendant le combat. C'est Robin Black, euh, John Randy, mais ils ont sorti ça, Bloody Bobby Sullivan. Il a demandé s'il aimait ça. Bobby nous dit que oui, il aime ça. C'est le fun sur un surnom qui est organique, euh, fait du sport dans sa vie, pas mal toute sa vie, puis c'est la première fois qu'il se fait donner un surnom de même. Euh, il est pas trop sûr que Patrick Leno est au courant, mais on va essayer de s'arranger pour qu'il se fasse introduire comme étant Bloody Bobby Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, man, I, I need to tell you, this comes out after the Blake Nash fight, okay? All right. So, maybe we can touch on that fight just right now for a couple minutes. Yeah, for just sure. your opinion on the fight, and then we'll just move on, because when people will see this, it'll be done. Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, your English is pretty good, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bilingual up in here. All right. So, like you touched on in your prediction video, you know, it's classic grappler versus striker. His best chance is to try to get me down where I can't knock him out. I'm going to hit him as hard as I can as long as we're on the feet. And if he gets me down, I'm popping right back up. I don't think uh, his wrestling is good enough to keep me down. And I don't think his stand up's good enough to keep him up. All right, all right, all right. C'est bon, c'est la manière dit. <rire> fait que dans le fond, et, et, que, il dit comme un peu, j'ai dit dans ma prédiction, wrestler contre euh, striker contre grappler, euh, Black Nash va essayer de le take down, c'est à ça qu'il s'attend. Il dit que s'il si va se faire take down, il va se relever tout de suite. Puis debout, il n'y a rien que Black Nash va être capable de faire pour rester debout contre lui. Il va se retrouver euh, le cul à terre. Fait que, yeah. <rire> on a hâte de voir ça. Personally, man, it's one of my most anticipated fights for... I'm so looking forward to see you because... Like, let's tell it, you got a kind of a style like Ada. Yeah. You're like two big guys, really tough guys. You like to box, go, swing hands, make a good show for the people. And I was really looking forward to, because as much as I love Ada, as, love, as much as he's my friend, as much as I always think that, man, it's so, so a tough first pro fight to be <laughs> faced up against Ada Daichka. And man, I just can't wait to see you fight against somebody else, man, somebody that I think you match up great against. And, I really look forward to that fight. I just had to say it is one one of the most anticipated fights for me. Oh on yeah, that exactly. Card. Like me, <laughs> I think that he could have put that on the main card. Like it's a main card fight. Like mm -hmm. it's a crazy fight there. It's gonna and uh, you got Nash that has like a what's his record? Three 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 three. So he's got experience and all that. But like even if he has experience, 
I think he's the like I think he's the underdog. Even if we, we had bets and all that, yeah, I'm pretty sure he ends up underdog. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adam. Like, and much respect to Nash. He's been in the game a long time, right? He's three and three. He's been doing this for many years, and I'm just getting started. I'm I'm zero one right now. So for me to call myself the favorite, it's kind of you know kind of hard to get out there. But uh, you know, I, I am expecting to win this fight. I'm going to try my best, and you know, if, if he can uh, if he can make his game plan work, he might put me in some trouble. But I really think that I've put in you know the right work. I've had the right game plan. I I had a great uh, you know, training camp, and I think I've done everything I need to to get that win and really get going and uh, try to yeah try to build my record a little bit. Owen one's not sitting good with me. <laughs> yeah, but uh, can, can you think of a better Owen one? Uh, yeah, maybe no, not for no, you, but for yeah. Adam. No, 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 <laughs> to ask and answer that about no, yourself. No, no, exactly, exactly. Because yeah. I know Mataolo started Owen one. That's a pretty good Owen one, but still, man, it's, it's tough. How can you be Owen one and like have fought? somebody that's worse that's better than you on their really really first fight first pro fight man uh, no, one of exactly. uh, the top prospects in the world let's face no, it no no but like uh, no 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 it's gonna be great you're, the game plan your game plan is to keep it on your feet and that's gonna be great i don't think he has the energy to like go into the late rounds and i know that you have energy because your energy was still there like you you got off your stool at the second round and you, you were still banging you know and all that so i know that that you got good cardio and all that so do you are you trying to bring him into the later rounds or are you just going for that straight finish you know what i, I do like to start fast i i like to get right in there you know uh, sometimes it's hard for me to get pumped up before the fight you know you always have nerves you're, you're thinking about what's he gonna do what am i gonna do uh just like in our fight i try to get out there and just get started and yeah. that can all just you know you get right past that right away yeah, right yeah. again like uh like you guys said oh and own one i'm not a bad own one they kind of threw me to the wolves or to the panda right away right <laughs> but uh no i i think that you know i i can really show people that you know against uh, some different competition i can really put my skills out there and and show people what i can do right I, i'm ready to you know break into this heavyweight division but you got a big uh i think you got a big amateur career Yeah, so I, I was uh, eight and four as an amateur. I actually started out one and three, and then I won my uh, yeah, I won seven of my last eight amateur fights okay, there. Right. Um, when I first started, I was just a boxer and you know kind of got my leg kicked off and got taken down for a couple fights. And I'm like, all right, we got to go back and learn the rest of this game. And once oh, I once sure. I rounded out my game, things were really starting to work for me. I had some amateur fights uh, in Quebec. I had some amateur fights down in the states. And uh, down in the states for amateur, they allow you to use the small gloves and no shin yeah, pads. Yeah, because I saw some tape on you like it was supposed to be amateur but you guys didn't have no shin pads you guys had like small kind yeah. of small gloves and all that so i was like that that doesn't look like some amateur fighting so, <laughs> so like your amateur fights like are basically some almost some pro fights for here down here in Quebec. yeah kind of like semi-pro they just didn't pay yeah that. yeah like what it was three minute rounds or was it five yeah it was? three three minute rounds okay yeah. okay and that's again, the only difference it was the, the the number of minutes yeah and they also don't allow knees or elbows to the head okay um, okay and but they they've actually kind of updated the rules down in uh, new york there now for your first couple fights um they make you wear shin pads okay. and when you go to the ground you can't strike to the head So they're starting to like um, put in some more rules, so it's a little less wild west and a little oh, more structured. Yeah, a little bit more secure for the guys starting off. Because you know, like I remember my first time we were fighting, I got the the, the the shit kicked out of me. You know, like you're just asking yourself if you want to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like it's good that they have rules and all that that you can like soak in your your toes. And, yeah, like, gradually and all that. But I know that the, yeah, the amateur fights like having amateur fights like that must have like helped you a lot to make the switch to a prof professional yeah, too. Definitely. And I think that, you know, I was lucky in, in the sense that I started out boxing and then I did some kickboxing fights and then I went to MMA. And when the first couple of MMA fights I did here in Quebec, you have, you know, boxing gloves and shin pads on. So yeah, I, yeah. I really slowly progressed up through the ranks rather than I know some people are taking their first ever competition as an MMA fight with, you know, four ounce gloves on. And that's that's a really tough start for some people. So I was lucky enough to really build my way up and feel comfortable the whole way. Right, perfect. And did you do boxing matches and all that before doing? Uh, yeah, I have about um, 50 amateur boxing fights. 50 amateur. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. You got experience. <laughs> oh, this is uh, this is uh, this is some great news. All right, so yeah, you. you you're, you're used to it. You're used to the feeling. And all that. Yeah, I've been I've been fighting for uh, over 10 years now. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. So I started out uh, when I was 14. I was only 168 pounds. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Little tiny guy. Um, but yeah. So I've been. I have a hard uh, time imagining that. <laughs> oh yeah. I was, I was tall but gangly. You know. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. All really, right. really skinny. So I started out uh, amateur boxing, and you know, I was in uh, the Ontario Boxing Association. It was um, kind of a, they broke off from Boxing Ontario, so it wasn't as big of a pool of people. But I got you know I got to fight every couple of weeks. So. And at 168. There's, there's more competition than that heavyweight. Yeah, exactly. So you know, you got a couple of fights there, and slowly, slowly built my way up. You know, to 185, then to 200. I had lots of fights. Uh, you know, when I was only like 16, I started having to fight adults because you know most heavyweights are are oh, bigger dudes. Oh, so really? yeah, so I, I had lots of experience. And then once I moved to kickboxing, uh, it was an easy transition. I wanted to get an MMA. You're watching UFC on TV. You're like, that's what I want to be doing. Oh, exactly. All right. And what are the other sports that you did you play growing oh. up? I played everything. I uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I played hockey. Um, I played baseball. I played a little bit of soccer in the summer. Um, when I got to high school, I played a lot of football. Oh yeah, yeah I yeah. imagine that. Yeah, I loved, yeah, I loved football. <laughs> Honestly, I was the biggest guy on the team, but I was the quarterback and the safety. So that was for real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So, so that, that means you, you you're not just a big tough guy. You got a good mind too. Because if you're playing safety and you play, because safety is basically the quarterback of defense. Yeah. And you're playing quarterback, so man. You, you, I wanted to make sure if they're going to get a touchdown, they got to get by me at some point. So. All right, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. That must have been really some good years. I, I played a little bit of football too, and like that's one thing of fighting that I, like this the, the, the team were the, the the team spirit and all that. You you miss it a little bit there. I, I kind of miss that a little bit. Do you miss that of uh, playing uh, team sports? Or? Yeah, I think the great thing about team sports is you do have other people to rely on. Um, you know, you can they can help you out when you're down, and it's really a moral support. And you guys are all in it together. When you're at practice, you're all practicing together. And which in, in MMA you do have a team that you practice with, and you guys have that connection. Um, but the one thing I like about MMA is if I lose, it's my fault, and if I win, it's because I worked hard. There's yeah. there's no one to blame and there's no one who can do it for me. Oh, exactly. That's a real, real good point. Cool. Uh, Tabarnouche, you're in stock, là. <laughs> Rapidement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rapidement, t'sais, pour revenir un peu dans comme Bobby euh, dit que quand il y en a des passes, il y en a des passes les premiers mille, 8, 4 amateurs, des combats amateurs souvent qui se sont retrouvés sans chaîne pad puis euh, avec des petits gants aux États-Unis plus particulièrement. Euh, plusieurs combats de boxe, 50 combats de boxe et plus amateur. Donc on s'entend que c'est pas pas de pas un nouveau venu dans la game, même si c'est seulement qu'un combat professionnel à MMA. C'est quelqu'un qui fait du combat depuis longtemps. Ensuite, rapidement. 14 ans, si je me trompe pas. Ouais, euh, 10 ans, une dizaine d'années. Ouais, exact. Depuis, depuis, depuis qu'il a 14 ans, il nous a dit ans. que son premier combat s'est déroulé à 168 livres, chose qui est le fun. Mais je sais pas si vous vous rappelez tout. Euh, D'ailleurs, me and Bobby were speaking about it uh, earlier. We, we saw, you saw one of your amateur fights where you were. Uh, uh, 205 is the, 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 the uh, I clocked in at 201 for a fight, but that's the mm -hmm. lowest that I was. And I was always pissed off because I was hungry. Fait que c'est ça, tout ça pour dire. Puis aussi, Bobby a fait plein de sports d'équipe dans sa jeunesse. Il a joué au hockey, au baseball, au soccer. Toutes les affaires qu'on fait quand qu on va, euh, quand on est des Canadiens qui vont à l'école. On, on joue au hockey, on joue au football avec nos amis. Puis, euh, chose intéressante, il était euh, QB et safety au football. Chose intéressante parce que c'est pas mal la même position, mais à l'attaque par la défense. Puis, euh, ce qu'il aime par rapport euh, au sport d'équipe versus au sport individuel, c'est que dans les sports individuels, s'il passe, c'est de sa faute. Dans les sports d'équipe, des fois, tu peux perdre à cause de ton équipe. Donc, euh, 100% du blâme, de la victoire ou de la défaite revient à lui dans un sport individuel. Puis, c'est ça qu'il apprécie. Uh, before we start... Uh, no, not before. Let's start. Let's talk about your fight, guys. Because that's one epic thing. And I wanted to ask you the first question. Do you know... How much of a legendary fight that is here in Quebec? Are you aware of that? Are you even aware of that? I get kind of a sense of it. I get tagged in a bunch of things on Facebook. I hit the old translate button, and people, <laughs> people seem to think that it was a pretty entertaining fight. And I, I had a great time doing it. Adam's a great guy, so it's nice to have a fight that we can we can share, we can enjoy, we can look back and talk about, and uh, you know, really uh, be you know good uh, good about it. And we really yeah, get along well, I think. <laughs> yeah, he told me, man, some moments that you shared like outside of the cage before the fight. You guys spoke and that, and you were on good terms before even entering yeah. the cage. So that I think that's pretty cool if you guys want to just share a little about this because I think it's cool because mostly we see big fights on TV nowadays. It's the trash talking era. Yeah. Let's be fair. It's the trash talking era. It's Conor McGregor saying stuff about that guy. Uh, that guy saying stuff about that guy. Like everybody's kind of on Tyrod Woodley is back right now. So it's <laughs> lots of trash talking and you guys delivered an incredible fight. 
without that you, you're in good terms we're all doing this together the podcast today so i just wanted you to like to share the experience of uh, mostly you because it was your first pro fight how yeah. was it first pro fight you come here you kind of you're cool with the guy you're fighting you speak then you go fight him it's like the one of the most uh, concussion inducing fight you've ever seen <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i had a hard time going up the stairs fast and all that for like a month after that oh. uh, <laughs> sorry man well no like, like, like he said like i remember like 10 15 minutes before getting into the cage we, we, we shook hands we gave ourselves like a little hug yeah. like I, I like the kind of guy you are. I respect you and all that. Let's go make a show. He's like, he, he, he thinks like me. Dude, let's go make a show. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did. And, uh, it was like MMA for me. It's, it's, it's respect. It's honor. It's being poised. It's all that. And the, a lot of guys are trash talking and bringing like all that kind of bad vibe to the sport. But like you can do, you can do a big fight and like be respectful and all that. And that's what real MMA is to me, you know? Yeah. And like, I, like we talked about before the fight, we're like, we're both here to have fun. Let's go out there. We'll put on a show. Uh, and one of the like greatest moments of the fight for me was when we came out and we both started throwing those crosses, right? And then I remember I just gave you a little bit of a smirk and you yeah. gave me a little bit of a yeah. smirk. And uh, I was like, oh, this is going to be a good uh, one. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> I, I remember. And that's what I said to everybody. Like after the fight and all that, because everybody like kind of uh, It's always like, oh, you got a big right hand, and if you touch somebody good, like, it's over and all that. But I never say that to myself because I don't want to get discouraged if it doesn't happen. Yeah, exactly. So we start off jab straight, jab straight. You give me a little smile. I give you a little smile. Right then, my brain went to, like, it's the guy who has the most cardio. Mm -hmm. it, it was like fighting myself. It was really weird, man. It was <laughs> like... It, I don't know. It was a copy copy. It's like a it's yeah, like, copy and yeah, it's, it's yeah. like a copy, man. It was like I know that it was the guy that would have like the, like you got an injury, but if if it went for that injury. It would have been who had the more gas in the tank. Yeah, we were really battling it out to the end. And that was, I had the same thought. I'm like, all right, we're, we're going to wear each other down here. Exactly. Like, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, we got to do this again later. One of us anyway, uh, right? So yeah, yeah. We're, we're just going at it. And I'm like, all right, like, just, just leave it all out there. Cause, you know, again, we, we have a lot of similarities. We both like the, the punch in and we're both uh, pretty good uh, on our feet, like moving yeah. around. And I, I thought the, the pace was really high. Oh, and, the pace was high for, uh, for a heavyweight fight. Uh, I that's the craziest thing about this fight, I think. That's the pace, because we've seen heavyweight slugfest, and but at that pace, man, like the fight started, you two guys trading right hands, and that pace never stopped. Wow. That's what's crazy, because most heavyweights they're dying after three minutes of doing this, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were you know, keep it going. And another thing that I find funny too about that fight. One of the only fight that ended uh, because of an injury TKO, and that nobody was complaining. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. No. <laughs> and like. I know they're going to try to probably match us up again against each other uh, another time. Sorry for stuttering right there. <laughs> But, like, we should do it in the UFC and get paid for it. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 like, that's a UFC kind of caliber fight for real. Like, yeah. you put that on a UFC card and people are going to be freaking, freaking out and all that. And, like, doing that for peanuts, man, we should wait and We do it in the USC. <laughs> well, and, you know, two guys who, again, we're, we're both, we got cardio, we're both going to punch as hard, like, as hard as anybody. We got hard heads and just really, you know, determined dudes. That fight's not going to go any other way, right? No, we're, no, exactly. We're, no, exactly. we're, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be locking swords the, the entire time until, yeah. like you said, until one of us wears the other one down. Yeah, yeah. somebody told me, like, are you guys going to fight? And I'm like, I don't know, but if we do, it's going to be a hell of a night. <laughs> <laughs> not looking forward to it, but. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's Tough thing to go sign that contract. Yeah, you know? it's like, all right, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> gonna put in the work for that one. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, today, Wayne. How did how did that go? Uh, you know, Wayne's is interesting. I've done in the amateur fights again down in New York. Um, there's a promoter down there, John Gibbons. He always does those uh, pre-fight weigh-ins too, like All the right. little a little bit of a show like that. He puts on fantastic cards down there, so he gave me a little bit of an idea of what it would be like when I got here. Uh, and then the first time we weighed in against each other, you, you had that uh, yeah, that chocolate that, bunny, yeah, yeah, that chocolate yeah. bunny, and I was like, to, to hide the, the right hand. yeah, that really took the the pressure off yeah, everything. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. like weigh-ins are just like you know, feel so bad for that fight <laughs> oh. though. And, uh, They, they kept me from saying what I had. Yeah. Like, I wanted to, like, 
two weeks before my hand was this big, I'm like, we got to tell Bobby or something. Oh. Like, no, 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 keep it secret, keep it secret. Yeah, I, I understand Bye. your standpoint, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, with, after that chocolate bunny thing, I'm like, weigh-ins are just fun, right? Like, we're not going to hurt each other on weigh-in day, and you're not going to say anything on weigh-in day that's going to affect the fight at all right? Right, right, so exactly. let's just go out there take a picture you know look tough for the picture but shake, <laughs> shake hands and let's just you know have some fun yeah no exactly but today you clocked in at how much uh, well, i was wait. 253 today 253 all right yeah all right, so right. four pounds up from my last fight all right yeah right. Oh, that's good that's good yeah. and how much did uh blake nash uh, not was, that much uh, 58 yeah 258 also, he lost a little bit of weight. Him yeah, too, yeah, he does. He does look like he's in a lot better shape than so his he last fight. Took and, his camp seriously. So. Yeah, and you know, I, I hope he did. Right, I, I don't want to go out there and uh, beat someone who doesn't want to be there. <laughs> no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm kind of a little bit of, like afraid that he's gonna fall into that like panic wrestling thing. Man. When you catch him with it right there, he's probably gonna he, he's gonna shoot the best single leg. So just if you did a lot of wrestling, you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I got a new wrestling coach, Jeff Blythe. He's here with us today. Uh, you know, Jeff's a huge dude. He's been wrestling his whole life, and he's been giving me a lot of those big guy tips, right? Uh, you know, there's certain things that work really well for heavyweights, and, you know, he, he knows exactly what to do in certain different positions. And, you know, there's a couple key positions that I think that, you know, if he does shoot that we might end up in, and I'm going to take advantage of those, and I'm going to show him that it's maybe not a good idea to shoot on me. No, no, no probably not. Because <laughs> yeah, if you if you become a, a good a good wrestler, I you don't really need it, but if you become a good defensive wrestler and nobody can take you down, man, you'll wreck some shit on the regional <laughs> level, man. <laughs> really, because I don't think it's the only time I heard Ada tell me that he's been it like really hard it was in your fight like I think it's the only time you really yeah. like thought about oh shit what I'm what am I doing here I gotta <laughs> I gotta like finish this guy or I don't know what he's gonna do to me through so I think that's a huge a huge advantage you've got right over there man in what? your hands that's pretty crazy too to have that like you two guys are you're, you're kind of born with it man that's crazy because there are there are heavyweight people who don't hit that or And I know it's kind of, I wouldn't say a myth, because it's true that heavyweight hits hard, but when we see heavyweight fights on TV, oh, these heavyweights, they hit hard. That are there really guys that, that got the natural power? And you two, you're guys that got the natural power, man. And well, I'm surprised that you, that, that you were as light when you were young. Because you got that, you know, you got that power, and you got that weight, and you got that transfer. Yeah. So, like, uh, I'm surprised that you were that light now, because I was always a big, big kid, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, when I was, like, you know, 13, I sprung up, like, seven inches over a summer, right? Yeah, and so, hurting the legs. Yeah, 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 so I was I was really uncoordinated in this, you know, skinny, skinny-looking kid. And over the years, I filled out, and I, I, I'm really happy that, like, I didn't get really... Uh, heavy all at once right i really slowly yeah. built up my weight and uh we were talking earlier when you when you start fighting when you're a smaller weight when you're younger like that you learn to keep that same pace and that same rhythm even though you're getting bigger you're obviously going to lose a little bit of it with the amount of size that you're putting on but i feel that i still have that you know i'm light on my feet like i used yeah, to be exactly. I, i'm able to i'm able to throw punches fast like i used to be i'm, I'm not heaving like some of these other heavyweights do because like most of the guys we're, we're, we're gonna say there like a lot of heavyweights they, they juice up Are they, yeah. they were small and they get to that heavyweight by juicing, you know, but you're mm -hmm. a natural big heavyweight. Yeah. That, that's the thing that surprises me that you were that small, <laughs> like younger, you know. And that's where I think there's the difference for the power. Like he's talking like you got the power, you got the big boy power because you're naturally heavyweight. But like, like an example, like a back and recycle, mm -hmm. he's probably a guy that like, wasn't that naturally a heavyweight, you know? So, like, it, it wasn't hurting. Like, the, 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 it didn't really hurt and all that, you know? But you, man, when you connect, man, it's something different. For real, man, you got some crazy power. Well, thanks. I appreciate the compliment. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've... Again, I played baseball my whole life, right? That helps with the, 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 the weight transfer. Yeah, the weight transfer and just that like quick snap, yeah, right? Yeah, until and, I got like eight years of baseball. Too nice. Yeah, and then same thing with football, right? You're throwing like you're throwing a football a lot. You you work on that footwork, keeping your legs underneath you. So you know, I'm not I'm not throwing these huge overhands as I'm running forward. I I got my legs well, underneath you, you, you're me. You're boxing straight. Like, yeah. It's the the, the 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 shortest way to get to your opponent. You know, 
old yeah. school. Like, and the, the vision that we have on a straight punch, it's harder to catch the distance and to, to, to weave it or to, to go back than if a hook is coming in. So you're hitting the right way to knock people out. Exactly. <laughs> stay, stay sharp, right? It, and once you start throwing those wide punches, that's where, again, at heavyweight, even if someone just catches you with a jab or a straight up the middle, it's, it's going to hurt if they turn the punch over properly. So you don't have as much leeway to try to really rip into those punches because you're leaving yourself open. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, you recuperate uh, to recuperate. Uh, how long was that? Um, so actually, like both the uh, tendons in my for, in my first bicep. off, what was the injury exactly? <laughs> so um, I had the two tendons in my bicep snapped off of my elbow, and so that's why my bicep pulled up onto my shoulder. So that was um, probably about a minute and a half into the fight. So then for I for real, yeah. And so you fought that long with a bicep jammed up right there? Yeah, so I, at first I didn't know what was wrong with it, right? Like I went to throw a jab and my arm bent the wrong way and I thought it was my elbow, like something was wrong with my elbow. But then, you know, I looked down and I'm like, oh, well, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, so <laughs> He kept fighting for another five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so then uh, my right hand, I had actually, um, I dislocated my middle finger like two weeks before the fight. So it was a little blown up. So I was kind of throwing my right hand a little more with my thumb than I should have been so then at the I think it was closer to the end of the first round maybe the middle of the first round I hit you uh, with the, my, my thumb and it shattered my thumb in a couple different pieces so at the end of the first round I'm sitting there I'm like okay I got no right hand I got no left arm like let's just go out and throw things at him right oh, so, that, so, that's a warrior spirit. yeah so I had I had a couple pins put in my right hand and then I had uh, you know my arm I was lucky to get surgery on the Sunday morning uh, so it was real soon and um, within you know I had a sling and a cast on all summer so that was that was tough living but around um probably end of september start of october i was able to get those off and then i was able to you know start doing some rehab start doing some physio and when i saw when i saw your fight with bakari in december i i text steph and i'm like i don't know if this is going to be ready or not but just book me a fight i need to do oh, i need to do something wow, right wow, <laughs> yeah so it's from then on it's just been like we're going hard training and you know doing you know doing 100 percent workouts and uh, you know, every, everything's feeling good now. I can f punch back 100%. And, you know, I've I've uh, tailored some training. Like I, I make sure I do a, a lot more extensive warm-ups um, to make sure that my arms okay. are, so that my arm's not going to re-injure. But, no, everything's feeling good. And, right. yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's back. A lot of a lot of people didn't think that I'd be able to come back. But yeah. I'm glad to, I'm glad to yeah, prove them wrong. It's all mental, you know. Like uh, Frank Mir, he had a motorcycle accident. The doctor said you're never going to walk again and became the heavyweight champion of the UFC. So it's all, it's a, it's a lot of mental part, I think. Yeah, great point. And how did you chill out? You know, how did you like just like, after the fight, what, what, what was your activities? And all that? Um, again, I was pretty limited throughout the summer. I had, you know, the sling and the cast on, um, you know, go to go watch baseball games or you know just hang out with family I, I have a huge family back in my yeah. town so you know there's lots of people to keep me company but you know uh once i was actually my my video game uh you know status went way down because i had a big cast on my thumb so i'm like trying i'm trying to play playstation and like getting pretty frustrated with myself so once that cast was off i played video games like you know you know five hours a night you know and until i could get back to training and then once i was yeah once i was back in training kind of you know it, it, it keeps you busy you're helping out your teammates who have fights coming up and you know i like to focus on have have a focus have a goal rather than just hanging out and you no, know no, for yeah. Sure. yeah what kind of video games you play uh, mostly sports games. I mean, me and Faye were talking about the uh, the new UFC game out. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about uh, Dana later. Oh, that's we'll awesome. Talk about Dana later. Yeah, but yeah, I, I play a lot of UFC. Punk, uh, so. A lot of NHL, um, even some Madden, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I get uh, really into some games. I'm actually a huge Star Wars guy too. So, okay. yeah, Star Wars Battlefront, I was, I was pretty heavy into that that's for a couple mind, of months. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not as good as I'd like to be, so there's a, the kill death isn't where I want it. But yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Man, I, I started playing this uh, PUBG there, uh, playing around no battlegrounds. Oh yeah, man, it's so hard. I'm, I'm so not good at shooting. Yeah. I get so nervous and like, oh, there's somebody, there's somebody. It's, it's super crazy. Yeah. Man. Same here. You, I, yeah, I, I can't control where my where my guns going. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, but there's a, like we were starting to talk with a lot of fighters and all that, and like. Basically, like everybody's a little bit, we're all like chill guys that play video games and all that. Yeah. And we're really smooth. And that's what I find cool, you know. Nobody's like a big hothead or whatever. Yeah, there's very few of them out there. Like, there's still those guys out there that are here to cage fight. 
you know, but most of us are here to do mixed martial arts and, you know, on the side, we can have a good conversation like this. And oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have lives outside of punching each other in the face. No, exactly. <laughs> that's one thing that's important for us to, 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 like, to show to people. Like, yeah, that's really one of, one of the that. main goal of the podcast, because I know a lot of fighters by being friends with them. And I want everybody to see you as humans more than as fighters because yes you're fighters but people they see what you do in the cage and they don't see what you do outside of the cage and i think it's important for like him or you or anybody that when you think about a bobby sullivan fight you say oh yes i like bobby sullivan because it's a big guy good boxing knocks people out but i like bobby sullivan because like he likes the same game as me uh, on the playstation or he does that thing that i like to do and i relate to him on that front too and that i think that's really important because many many people and all over the world all over the any sphere of whatever people are doing the the most famous people they they have things that you can relate to yeah. them yeah about the people that get stuck the most with the people with the like uh i don't know if you're into uh, hip-hop music but uh chance the rapper he's really a relatable guy because he's from chicago which is one of the most violent town and he's involved in many uh positive uh, causes he's giving money to the city and he's really present in the city and the bad neighborhoods of the city to try to make some good and pull out the happy vibe and in his music he's really like gospel inspired so it's really positive music too and He's become one of the most favorite rapper and he never sold a CD. He's independent and all his CDs are for free on uh, streaming services or you can download it on the internet. And I really find it interesting how he became one of the biggest guy in hip hop, one of the most paid guy in hip hop, a guy that he has co-signs from Kanye West, from Andre 3000, from Outkast that are huge names and It's all because the guy is so relatable, man. You see what he's doing and you're like, oh man, I, I do that stuff too. And it's, it's Chance the Rapper and a big rapper, a big name. And I do that stuff too. And I think that's why the guy's really relatable. And that's, I really want to bring that to the table with you guys. Because I think that's the most important. We're all humans first before yeah, being yeah. caged fighters or jiu-jitsu guys in my, uh, In my case, <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent example. And like you said, when you can relate to the person, that's what makes you really care about the result of their fight, or that exactly. makes you want to go the extra mile to go to their concert, right? Like you, you want to know what's up with this guy's life rather than just, you know, I'm, you know, oh, he has this cool song that I like, or oh, he had a cool fight where he got punched in the face a bunch. Like, um, yeah, we're, we're humans too. Like I, like I said, we have a life outside of fighting. I actually, I teach grade seven, eight back home. For real? Yeah. I, uh, I was listening to you talk and I was like, man, this guy's really educated. I was like, the way you speak and all that, man, I was about to talk about that. You, so, like, grade seven and eight, that's like a secondary. Uh, yeah, like, he's, he's like, like one kids. and two. Yeah, like, like 13, 14. Yeah, yeah. it's so called I heard do Because right, so we've got only, I think, six. Yeah, we got six grades. We got six of, grades of elementary, five okay. five of high school. Then we okay. got the Sejep, which is fucking stupid, but that's a good description <laughs> for another. Yeah, we have like, uh, our high school is only like nine, 10, 11, 12. So like the grade seven, eight is like the big kids in the middle school, right? So yeah, yeah it's, it, they're a great time, right? It's, it's fun being in there every day. Um, but yeah, again, they kind of know that their teacher does some cool stuff on the side as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, you teach what, uh, what, uh, subject. Subject. Um, so, For the way the school works in Ontario, I have uh, pretty much everything other than music and French. Okay, all right, all right. You, you really got to pay hey, it's comme nous autres au primaire. C'est comme nous autres au primaire. Moi, du moins, c'est le même. J'avais un prof. Puis on avait un prof de musique. On avait un prof d'anglais. Mais tu sais, on avait notre prof qui donnait vraiment à tout. Tu sais, au secondaire, on changeait tout à la classe. Puis tout, oh, mais primaire, c'est ça. Ah, ça. It kind of works the same way as it does uh, here. Okay. Because so, up to sixth grade elementary school, we only had one teacher and we had like a music teacher and an English teacher and a physical yeah. teacher. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, physical education teacher. And um, then after high school, it all changes, but it, it, I think it works kind of the, the same way. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm lucky enough I get to teach gym, so that's a good part of my oh, day. Oh, you teach gym yeah, too? Yeah. Right, I, uh, right. You know, I, like I coach the boys basketball team there. Um, so I get to do some fun stuff. Um, it's interesting though, like some, some subjects you're not always like the, the expert on, like I'm teaching dance right now. So that's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting. Okay. So what, what, what type of dance or choreography you got there? Uh, for the 
so yeah, for the first half of the year, you do drama. Second half, you do dance. We just finished our first dance project, and um, was it on Despacito? <laughs> 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 uh, well, so what we uh, the big first project uh, cannot get into it too much was like understanding, um, you know, um, how your dance is expressing the song that you're listening to. So understanding the the lyrics and what their theme is and what the message is and exactly what the lyrics are trying to portray and what the song's trying to portray and trying to express that with your with your dance moves. All right. All right. Yeah. What song did you pick for the... Uh, actually, there's a couple different groups doing all different okay. songs. My favorite one, though, was they did Ponder Replay by Rihanna. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, was, yeah, I'm like, yeah. I, they, they were trying to come up with one. I'm like, okay, this is my you know big song when I was in grade eight, and they just they nailed it. It was excellent. So great job, guys. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I, that, that's like... That's really crazy to know that you're a teacher, man. That's really, really, really... Just pour être sûr que le monde a compris, là, tu sais, c'est... Uh... C'est facile à comprendre, tout le monde sait ce qu'est teacher, mais Bobby est professeur, même professeur d'école. Euh, nous autres, ça serait l'équivalent d'un secondaire 1 ou 2. Euh, c'est 7 and 8 grade en Ontario. Ça, ça marche pas pareil un peu l'école, mais c'est un peu la même affaire. Donc, il euh, y a des jeunes de 12-13 ans. C'est comme nous, à l'école primaire, dans le fond, ils donnent pas mal toutes les matières, sauf musique en anglais. Fait que là, il est en train de donner des cours de danse à ses euh, élèves. Chose qui est quand même drôle. J'imagine que Bobby, c'est un grand danseur. Euh. Well, I always say, if you can fight good, you can dance. <laughs> I've said the same thing, Adam. Yeah. Exactly, man. I mean, you might not like my dancing, but I can dance. <laughs> fait que c'est ça, euh, quand on disait qu'on aime ça faire découvrir les combattants, je t'en dans quelque chose autre qui est euh, le MMA, ben Bobby, c'est un professeur. Just oh, like my mom, too, I just gotta say, my mom is a teacher. So oh, nice. Uh, I got a, a lot of teachers in my family. I got a, uh, my uh, godmother. My godmother is a teacher, too. But I think she, she's not a teacher, she's like a... Uh, I wouldn't know how to say this in English. It's called orthopedagogue in French. She's like a specialist for people who got trouble okay, in, yeah. in class. But she's still a teacher because in her school, it's like only trouble kids. But not trouble like uh, acting wise. More that it's all immigrants. Oh, okay. Nobody really speaks French. Okay, so it's like a, like a resource teacher, yeah, yeah, like exactly. an educational system where they... She's, they, she's like yeah. the real teacher of the class, but she's not like a form teacher. She's... Um, However, however, it's name in English. I don't know, but she, she she's like a specialist who tries to uh, get them used to uh, always over here to the French language, so that they can maybe go into a real regular school someday. Okay, well, she could help me out. Then I could do this in French next time. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, is it something that you always knew that you wanted to be a teacher when you were young? Or um, I mean, I I like being in front of a crowd. You know, right, I, right. I, you know, I go, I, I go half naked in front of thousands of people and get punched <laughs> in the face. So standing in front of a bunch of 12 year olds isn't that bad. Um, but no, like, again, I, I like, uh, I like the aspect of teaching where when you really get to connect with them and where they l really learn something and you really get to pass on some sort of knowledge or some realization that you've made in your life. And, you know, you help people understand it or maybe get through a hard situation. So there's, yeah, really rewarding parts about teaching that I've always really enjoyed. Oh, yeah, I went to Western University in London. So your mom must have, like, flipped out when, like, my, my son's in university, he's going to be a teacher and all that, but he still wants to go in a cage and fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like, um, when I was finishing up high school, I really wanted to uh, to turn pro. Right. Uh, at that time, I was going to do some pro boxing fights while I, you know, finished rounding out my MMA game. Um, but she, you know, drew the hard line. You have to finish university before you go pro. Okay, so, okay. you know, I went and I, I did my four years of university. And then I was like, oh, you know, I, I was thinking about going to teacher's college. She's like, all right. So after you finish that, you can go pro. So she, she made sure I got the paper before I got smacked in the head too much. Oh, well, that's, that, 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 that's really good. Man. No, and you know what? I appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's, it's intelligent and wise. You know? Yeah. Again, there's always there's always time to go out and do this fun stuff. You, you have to, you know, really put your mind to getting that uh, that education first and making sure that you you have options out there. I could have gone out in our fight. You could have taken my head off, and you know, I'd be sitting at home with nothing to do right now. Oh, right? Fifteen hundred boxing fights, and I don't know how much kickboxing fights, and all the MMA. I mean, like, you can take a lot of damage. You know? yeah. So it's good that you finished your school and all that. But the, the kids must listen to you. <laughs> well, I've said this before. I mean, if you think back when you were like 13 years old, what, what, would it look cooler to, you know, yell at some old lady who's teaching you or to yell at a, a, a an MMA fighter, fighter, right? Yeah. You know, they, they, they feel, they feel, uh, 
you know, like they can, when they stand up to you, they feel pretty good about themselves sometimes. Oh, so, man. so you, you do get a couple that are, uh, you know, they like to start, uh, you know, arguments with you. But for the most part, I have a really great group of kids and, you know, they're, you know, they're all fantastic. They, they, they work really hard. Um, they inspire me on a daily basis. And I think it's great to have, you know, them and, you know, it really keeps you grounded. I, I never walk around like I'm Bobby Sullivan and the cage fighter. You know, oh, I, every geez. day I got to come into school and every day I got to, you know, put up the homework list and, you know, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't let you get in your head too much. It must be hard to to to, 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 to dabble between like being an MMA professional fighter and being a teacher. Like you got to go home, you probably got to correct some 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 tests and all that, but you still got to hit the gym. And like, man, you yeah. must be tired. It, it, it keeps me busy. <laughs> it does keep me busy. Um, but you know, it, it's it's kind of two different worlds, right? Like I go out and I it's an you know academics all day. I get to think on a high level, but then I get to go home and I get to beat people in the head and get my you know get yeah, get, get yeah, all the frustration right. out and really you know enjoy that side of my life. So it, it's nice to have both. All right, all right, that's awesome, man. That's <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm really impressed right now. I, I didn't think that you were a teacher. And all that. That's like news that I just like yeah, happened to to, to 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 get it, man. I'm really. This is awesome. For real, I, I find it awesome, man, oh. that you're a teacher and all that. Thanks a lot, Adam. Yeah, yeah giving like to the giving back to the youth and passing your knowledge and all that. There's that's way cool. Ah, yeah. c'est vraiment cool. Uh, ça fait déjà 45 minutes. J'avais d'autres petites oh, affaires que je voulais right. qu'on parle. Right. Uh, we're already 45 minutes in. Uh, I, I wanted to speak about other things. One of the things, man, this got out today. <laughs> Adam. Je pense pas que tu le sais, non. mais euh, <rire> sur le EA Sports UFC 3, il y a un nouveau euh, joueur, un nouveau euh, character qui a été euh, rentré dans le jeu aujourd'hui, c'est dans le nom de la patch, il devrait apparaître dans ton jeu. Euh, un fighter qui a 91 en striking, 86 en grappling, 86 en stamina, puis 90 en health. Peux-tu deviner qui est ce combattant-là? Euh, C'est-tu un ancien ou quelqu'un de plus nouveau? Il n'y a aucun pro fight. Aucun pro fight? Ah, c'est qui qui a dit qu'il était, qu était pro? Euh... Ah. Gros, c'est Dana White. Non! <rire> <rire> oh, non! Oh, ouais! Dana, Dana White est rendu dans le jeu, puis gros, je euh, vais essayer de retrouver ça. Il y a quelqu'un qui m'a envoyé ça par Messenger. Carl euh, Deschaines. Shout out, Carl. <rire> Puis, euh, il disait, gros, c'est ridicule, là, tu vas capoter. J'ai juste un peu assez de pull-up le tweet, les sites. Oh, et... According to UFC 3 game, Dana Striking is equivalent to Go Kansaki. <rire> his health is equal to Alexander Gustafsson. His stamina is better than Lyoto Machida. And his grappling better than Anderson Silva. Oh. Okay, okay. Comment, man. Comment. Well, <laughs> you're the president of the UFC, so you can probably have what you want. And <laughs> I know that he did a little bit of boxing younger, but I don't like. There's a reason why he promotes fights today, and that he never turned pro and all that. You know, so <laughs> he he always say he didn't like to get hit in the head and all that, but ah, it's okay. He's the president. You can kind of do a little bit what you want there. Oh, uh, I'm less surprised of that as uh, if it would have been like Donald Trump. Je pense que quand même que le monde aurait aimé ça avoir Donald Trump dans le jeu pour voir le tableau. Whoop it Donald Trump's ass on a regular basis. T'es-tu capable de venir dans quelle division ils l'ont mis? Ok, so the division... C'est pas un gros gars. Yeah, he's kind of stocky, but he probably probably put him in the welterweight. 205. Like Dynamite comme John Jones. Of Chuck Liddell. People are talking about it. Chuck uh, against Tito and Bellator. And oh, against Tito, yeah. But yeah. not against like some young gun that's like super like in super shape and like too much cardio and all that. Like the guy, like, he, he did what he had to do in the sport. But against Tito, yeah, that would be cool. 
Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that he he decided to come back, and if he does come back in Bellator, right, as a guy who was you know kind of a UFC company man for so long, mm-hmm. right? And of course, Tito he really got promoted well over at Bellator. They you know, kind of made him the face of their company for a while, so I can see why he would want the fight over there. Um, obviously, they're going to pay Chuck pretty well to come back, and I'd never tell a fighter if he wants to fight that he can't. You know, that's up to doctors. That's, that's, that's up to that's doctors to do. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a really good. The point. funny thing is that. He started talking about coming back to fighting as soon as there were new owners in the UFC and like they cut all these jobs that he and uh, some other guys had. I think uh, maybe Matthews. I think Matthews. They all had jobs. They were getting paid by the UFC, but they absolutely did nothing. They were just getting paid not to fight because uh, Dana probably knows uh, Chuck Little is fucking stupid. And as soon as he thinks about fighting, he wants to fight. And uh, he probably. <laughs> So he just paid him not to fight, but as soon as the new owners came, they cut these jobs because they had to cut the cost because they just paid like four fucking billion yeah, for a company. But, uh, but the, the Bellator loves to like steal those kind of money. Yeah. That would be a big comeback fight and all that. It's marketable and all that, but Bellator loves to, to steal those fights and they give, they give a lot of money. And like what I, what I heard of fighters that were fighting for UFC and now fight for Bellator, you treated really well in Bellator. So that's maybe a thing that's interesting for you guys. Yeah, and you've got your own sponsors. Rory made uh, $250,000 from a cryptocurrency sponsor. Wow. That's incredible. And uh, Rory, Rory is probably rich. When you think about it, like Rory was fucking talking about Bitcoins back in like 2011, 2012. He was talking about that stuff like it was the future. So he must have more than one Bitcoin at that time. Yeah, probably, probably. Well, there's kind of two sides to the coin on the sponsorships over there. Someone like Rory can get that kind of money. Someone like Chuck is going to get a ton of money for sponsors, right? But, you know, someone, uh, you know, some people that move over from uh, the UFC who aren't that popular of a guy aren't going to get a crazy amount of sponsors to show off, you know, in Bellator. Um, Again, they they might get sponsorship money, but is it going to be equivalent to what they're making uh, in exposure and, you know, uh, in... Honestly, as, as a competitive guy, I would want to be in the best league there is. So you're kind of giving up being, you know, named as the best fighter in the world, where I believe Rory McDonald is the best fighter in the world. We've seen him against Tyrone Woodley already. He beat him. Um, but as a Bellator champion, you aren't given that same amount of respect and you aren't named the best fighter in the world. Yeah, it'll, it'll just be there, like, to, to, to bring up the, the name of the other guys. Like, let's say Douglas Lima. I think everybody can say now Douglas Lima is probably one of the top 15 guys yeah, terrific in the world. fighter but we kind of knew that but didn't know that until he fought uh, Rory now mm-hmm. he fought Rory was competitive okay that guy he's a top guy so now Lima is just lost but his stock is up because of Rory that sadly won't happen to Rory there's not one guy that he can fight that his stock will go up and if he goes one up to 185 and fights Gegard yeah, he, he was looking at that. That's maybe the only yeah. fight that could raise a stock, but it's true that he's kind of stuck uh, there, but stuck there making lots of money. You're right. They're kind of going to use him as a gauge. They're going to say, look how great our fighters are compared to Rory McDonald. Exactly. We all know how good Rory McDonald is, so look at how good our fighters are in comparison to him. Exactly. When I, I, when I look at Bellator, it reminds me of contemporary America. There are the big names that make a lot of money, get a lot of sponsors since they get get their own sponsors. And on the bottom of the same card, there are guys like fighting for 800 bucks. Mm-hmm. Oh, for real? <laughs> <laughs> like 800, 1,000, 1,200. See? Uh, if you're a 4-4 guy that they signed to face like their new brand new wrestler that's making his first pro fight, I think you're not getting much money. And you're not winning that fight too, so. <laughs> yeah. and, and that gets overlooked sometimes, right? It, um, at least with the UFC, there is a minimum contract, right? With yeah. uh, with Bellator, you are going to get, you know, maybe not as much as you're worth sometimes until you make a name for yourself. Yeah. Like you said, with a, a foreign fighter coming over who has no exposure over here, where no one is paying especially to see that person on the card, they might accept a contract where they aren't getting paid what they're worth. And again, they have to build that name up and try to uh, make sure that people know who they are and want to tune in to see them before they start seeing uh, the benefits of it financially. No, 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 for sure. Like the, the, the route to go for that is kind of like, you got to make your name in UFC and then you got to get stolen by the tour then they're going to pay you a lot, a lot of money. But mm-hmm. like, if you stay in UFC, what I believe is it gives you a better uh, after career. Yes. Um, but 
like just to throw it back at you, Adam, like these Bellator guys who have been working their way up for years, right? Like let's say at welterweight, they've been working their way up for years. Maybe they're ranked like fifth, sixth or something. And then Rory McDonald comes in and he's making way more money than you. How would you feel like, say, as like someone who's been in TKO, who's had a lot of fights, a lot of entertaining fights and has done a great job there. You know, you're working your way up and you're getting paid a certain amount and then they sign somebody, uh, maybe someone who's just coming from Bellator or someone who just got cut by the UFC and they're getting paid more than you. Yeah, no, no, for sure. It's, it's, it kind of gets on everybody's nerve, you know, because you're doing the same efforts of the other guy and you're doing, like, the same job. And, yeah, it's, like you said, it's pretty much showing how America is, you know. They're giving, like, 99% of the money to 1%, and then, like, everybody's fighting for the scraps and all that. Yeah. So, yeah, you should, like, like, it's fun, like, the UFC has a, a base salary and all that. That's better for the, for the athletes, but, like, uh, I don't know, they, they, they tried to do like a, uh, like a group of people that, are, that wanted to like, come uh, to travail, a group of social people. The Fighters Union. Yeah, Fighters Union. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 what, what's happening? Did you have a buddy have information on that? You can't uh, it or did they, they just stop it? The, the latest project that seemed to be good it seems like it's going on, but they're really going out their way to not get talked about. Because okay. all the other ones, I think there was the one that GSP was there with Bjorn Ripney and stuff. And they did the big press conferences and it's literally the only time we heard about it and after we didn't hear about it anymore. So I think it's named Project Spearhead. I know there's Leslie Smith in it. I know there's Cajun Johnson in it who's fighting uh, tomorrow in London. And like... Uh, I think she uh, Leslie went on the MMA hour with Ariel Alwani and she spoke a little bit about it, but she really said that she does not want to get some press about this. She really wants to keep it on the low and try to get the fighters together and like do a real effort to do something, just not go there, kind of flash to the media and just say, oh, we tried, we did our part and yeah. keep, it, keep, keep, it, keep it going without change. But still... I like to kind of compare it to um, the forming of a union to like the weight cutting rules that have uh, tried to be instituted. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, with it being an individual sport, there's always going to be people who are, you know, going to do what's best for them. So if you put in weight cutting rules, everyone might n know that it's what's best for everybody, right? Like if we all just follow these weight cutting rules, we'll all be healthier. But one person's going to, you know, cut a little bit more, right? Just to make sure that they have the advantage size wise. So if you make this union, it, it is best for everybody if there's a union and a base pay and a certain amount of benefits that we all get. But there's going to be those people that, well, no, if I just don't join the union, I'm more likely to make money. I'm more likely to get signed. And so whenever we're in an individual sport, there's always going to be those couple of people. And, you know, it's, it's kind of your own decision, right? Are you going to go with uh, kind of the group and try to do what's best for everybody? Or are you going to try to do what's best for you? Try to get your money because we don't know how long we're in the sport, right? No, exactly. That's a really good point that you made up right there. You're always going to get those guys that don't give a rip about the community, you know? True. <laughs> well, and again, the community is not going to pay your bills when, when you're retired. So. No, that's for sure. But Conor McGregor does not give a shit about the community, okay? But let's face, it, let's face it, he's probably the guy that brought the most changes to that community. By doing things for himself, yes, but he showed that guys know that they can make money. Before him, there was guys like GSP and all, they made money. But I guess GSP was not like in bars throwing stacks of cash at hookers and stuff like that. So people <laughs> knew that he was, he was getting money, but... They didn't see it. McGregor is showing that he's getting yeah. money. And like, it's impossible not to know that you can get really paid well with that sport. And he brought so much to the table just by showing that. And now people, they know it. Like, people don't do it well. Let's say it like Tyron Woodley is trying to, to be like that more tra trash talker guy. And he's just getting bashed by everybody because yeah. he sucks at it and he's boring. But at least... It, McGregor, he put that on the table. He showed people that you can get money. And I think sometimes really selfish acts can end up doing great for the whole community, even if it's done selfishly. Yeah, yeah, I kind of see what the, the point that you're bringing there, but like, man, it's kind of be hard to act like 
<laughs> no, no, I, nobody wants to act like McGregor, man. But <laughs> yeah, I, I've always, uh, I've always said being genuine is the best way to go. He's genuinely, you know, that kind of person. I think uh, Chael Sonnen said it: just be a bigger version of yourself, right? Don't try to be someone you're not. Just be a bigger version of yourself. You are an entertainer. You do have to, you know, say the things and do the things that people want to see and want to watch. But you can't be fake, or else it's really easy for people to see that with the Tyrone Woodley example. Yeah, exactly. yeah and there was talk about Sage Northcutt, but I think most people now really start to like Sage, and it it has come when people just realize that he's like this man. It's not a game. He's not like that Mr. Bullet guy. And now he's really like this man. It's really if you train with him, you roll with him. It's thank you, Mr. Artel, when you're done. Yeah. It's it's he's the well, guy. Martial arts for me is really. Yeah, have respect. So the guy is really, yeah, he's really like this, and all this innocence that we say, oh, is it a, is it a uh, portal? Is it a game? No, he's really like that, young and innocent. So that's why I think like more, more people like him. But it's true what you were saying. If it's easy to see, man, when you don't gotta be uh, fucking uh, Albert Einstein to see that the guy's faking in your face. Yeah, <laughs> and I think with, with Sage, it was just hard for people to really believe that someone could be genuinely that nice and like <laughs> that caring. And he is that person. He's won people over. Like I, I think he's a great guy. He's just you know he's a, he's a great um, personality to have. Like you know we we do have those guys who are kind of rough and tumble, but we also have Sage Northcuts. Yeah. Right? Well, like Anthony Johnson was a was a cool cat too. You know, he was yeah. real, real like uh, always respectful. Yeah. Oh, younger days, it was a little. Yeah, not that, not that much with his wife, though. But <laughs> 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 that's another uh, pair of story. But yeah, for every Mike Perry, you gotta have a Sage and Earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> match him up, match him up. I want right, to see that. That would be good. That would be good. So uh, you're basically 24 hours away from your fight. Uh, do you have like a routine, like uh, the day, the, the night before the fight? Do you have like? A, um well for like for many of my fights it's same day weigh in for when i was boxing right you would you would weigh in uh see your doctor wait three hours and then fight so it that's always tough right you get like three hours of dead time you can't really get a nap in it's it's hard to do much you know loosening up before that right um with the day before weigh-ins i i find it's a lot of waiting so i like to chill out play some video games i like to watch a movie um it's just keep your mind off it because there's not a lot i can do now you know, to change the result of the fight. I've done my training. I've done my studying. We've watched all the videos. We've, you know, drilled and all the different techniques that we need to. Right now, it's just, let's just get to the fight. I'm ready to go. All right. All right. <laughs> That's a good fucking mentality. So you brought your, your PlayStation on? Yeah, right? PlayStation's here. All right. All right. And uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier. You guys drove like nine hours to come here? Yeah, it's a long drive. You know, uh, I'm from really small town. Uh, like 2,000 people. Uh, it's in uh, Midwestern Ontario, uh, about two hours north of Toronto. Um, so we gotta, you know, get through all the all the cow fields down to the highway, and then once you hit the highway, it's yeah, a good, you know, um, seven hours uh, once you're on the highway. Um, you take a couple breaks, right, just to make sure you're not going crazy on the way here. It's a long way. I'm a big dude. It's a small car. <laughs> Your are areas are awesome in Ontario, though. Oh, they're they're terrific. We, we yeah. literally don't have this in Quebec and when we have this it's like kind of a park close to the wood there's like a, a toilet with blue stuff in it that you oh. got a like a blue cabin toilet like, it's interesting we, we know table. a little yeah. picnic table yeah. Yeah. we know when we're in Quebec because like in Toronto it's called an en route right yeah. and then once we start seeing the St. Hubert's uh, again, we don't have those in Ontario. It seems like the huge thing here. Like, okay, I see the chicken place. We're probably in Quebec. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. When, when, you get, when you get out from Ontario, like it's it's literally the first thing in Quebec you have is a rest area with a safe spot and a fucking coastal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I know you're in Quebec. When I'm driving, I know uh, that I'm Ontario when it starts to get smooth. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Quebec is. And then you get to Ontario. Like, oh. <laughs> like, what happened to our like? And you see, you see the big uh, poster that's telling you that if you go like one six, one sixty on the highway, they're gonna find you like fourteen thousand <laughs> dollars. No, it's take, nice. take out your driving license for like fifteen years. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's nice because they give you like you know your speed and how much they're gonna charge you, so you can find the best value. It's like okay, <laughs> if I drive at one forty, they're only gonna charge me this, whereas if I drive one sixty, it goes up a lot. So let's go about one forty five. <laughs> and your and your your Ontario patrol they're black man 
and that's we're used to white cop car here so okay. when we're driving we're looking at the horizon and we see a little white stuff there oh, that, that's the police man that's yeah. the police so now, but in Ontario as soon as it starts to get dark, dark outside okay. you just don't see it because the front of the car is fucking black yeah. you just pass and then oh shit there was a car oh no the police yeah. it's almost <laughs> like you have to obey the law all the time Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you guys are you're so polite man and it's true uh, when when we go uh, when I go into Ontario I go to Toronto a couple times a year to go see show mostly shows and uh, man people are polite man like you bump somebody and he's saying oh man I'm sorry that I, that I bumped into you I'm so yeah. sorry man and well Canadians we get our like uh reputation from places like yeah yeah exactly because yeah. in quebec nobody gives a shit about <laughs> nobody man <laughs> it's really <laughs> bad out there yeah, there's no pedestrian rights out on these streets i learned that real quick yeah the only way to not die when you're walking in the streets is if you're paying attention not to get hit by a car <laughs> especially in montreal here with the traffic and stuff when the car thinks he can go, he'll go, man, he does not care about you if you're walking. <laughs> he'll fucking go, because if the light turns red, there's like another minute, two minutes waiting there. People are fucking crazy. I, walk around and I think <laughs> big city mentality does not fit well with Quebec mentality. Yeah. Because we're not patient people, man. <laughs> yeah, you gotta walk around in full sparring gear out there, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nuts. Alright, so... Just to, to show everybody that you're like a real simple guy, like you got your PlayStation, you listen to a little movie, you just get prepared for tomorrow. Yeah, we watch, we watch teach some kids, uh, man. That's yeah, awesome. that's that's awesome. The guy's a teacher and all that, real educated. You can see the way you talk and all that, and then, oh, it's. Just avant qu'on y j'ai pas le choix de faire ça. Before we go, I got no choice, man. Uh, when there's a heavyweight fight in the UFC, I got to have you speak about it. And we've got another heavyweight here. So quickly, man, like maybe a minute or two each. Uh, London's main event, Verdum, Alexander Volkov. Oh, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, look, uh, Volkov uh, did a good performance the last time. I think his last fight was uh, Stefan Struve, right? But like Stefan, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that 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 that's the same. Like Stefan Struve, uh, he's, he's a little bit like a, a rite of passage. I don't know. Like everybody smashes that game, but he could be such a problem for the division, the whole division. But no, he brought out a good fight. Uh, Verdum, he's starting to get some good. Uh, good at work on it with his hands and all that but I think he's going to try to probably bring it to the ground and like I don't think there's a heavyweight that can stay on the ground long and get up like it's not a good idea it's really it's really a bad game plan so it's probably going to see uh, the, 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 the the taller guy trying to work his jab and just stay out and all that but like Verdun's got some good like with the the, the Kane fight. He showed that he, uh, he's got some pretty good, uh, pretty good standards. The Travis Brown won too, man. The five round yeah. decision. He beat Travis Brown like quite handily. And yeah. then we we we've come to find out Travis Brown sucks, but <laughs> 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 at that time it was a really all, good all, win. All, all, like Travis, Travis Brown, Brown is kind of like a Scott Gomez, Gomez. as Coach Edmund factor. <laughs> yeah. That like, guy was at a good camp. Good at the first, and like he never came. I was at a good too. camp, and he left. Yeah, to go with uh, Coach Edmund because of his wife, uh, Rhonda. Yeah, well, and, uh, when Coach Edmund touches you, you become a bad fighter. Look at Jake Ellenberger, <laughs> look guys. at Travis Brown. <laughs> That's what happens, man. Yeah, the guys are going good and then he switched camps and trying to like repair something that's not broken it was with mm -hmm. uh, Jackson Wink and he left there like the, the one of the greatest camps in the world uh, to go train with a guy that's only there to scream and movement in your <laughs> corner <laughs> yeah. well and I think Travis went from a guy who was again he was a college basketball player really light on his feet really athletic and once he went to Edmond he was he planted his feet he was using his like his one twos a lot but again just not using that athleticism not using those kicks that he was so successful with yeah. before um, but back to Volkov and uh, Verdum I think you know, he's Volkov is great with his hands. He's, he's great at using his distance, and he does that very well. Uh, I'm not sure if he has uh, good enough uh, 
take down defense in order to not have Verdum take him down. Verdum, again, he's really good at understanding. No one wants to go to the ground with him. So he's really aggressive with those strikes. He really moves in hard with his strikes and he can come out with those flying side kicks because he's not worried about someone taking him down. At the same time, we've seen Verdum is susceptible to getting caught coming in when he chased Stipe. He, uh, he got clipped by, uh, you know, really, really short, uh, late right and it took yeah, him but right he got out. hurt. And like your brain is gonna go to yeah. two reactions, yeah. fight or flee. Yeah. And he he fight it, he advanced, and he got clipped with another one. But Stepe, yeah. Stepe is like one of the guys that can hit you powerfully going back to. So. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like you said, I don't think Volkov is Stepe, and no, I, th- no. I think that yeah. Verdum uh, gets in on him. Whether he he uses his clinch because he's been you know amazing knees inside, like we did to Roy Nelson. Um, whether he uses that clinch game, whether he, he gets him down and submits him, I think that uh, probably it's probably a Verdum five round decision. Oh, all right, all right. And what? what- kind of gets me going in that direction too is the fact that uh, Verdum yes he can get clipped but he got finished by KO twice by Stipe Miocic Junior Dos Santos so Ooh. not uh, not some small hitters there oh, Junior Dos Santos and, uh, like a lot of people like even Roy Nelson said the guy that hit him the hardest was Junior Dos Santos yeah. and the guys who beat Volkov they close the distance put him in the clinch against the cage yeah. strike a little bit from there but mostly with knees take down ground and pound Shake Congo did that Uh, Vitaly Minakov did that and even a guy named Tony Johnson which is good fights for Bellator but not like a heavyweight that you, you would try to bring in your promotion not the guy you need but a good guy competent yeah. fighter but uh, Fabri- Fabricio Verdum is one of the guys that even if he's getting older is staying really good like a lot of guys that we see like here, like recently like Machida or things like that they put him against the younger guns and It's just like a stepping stone and all that. But even if he's getting to the age where the younger guns could probably take him out, he's still doing the job. You know, he's still really dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Ver- Verdum, uh, what is he now, 40? Like, uh, yeah, he's got yeah. It, he's got yeah Verdum at 40. Man. He, he destroys Verdum at 30, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. He's got good wine. <laughs> <laughs> he <gets> better. <laughs> Yeah, but it's true, man. Uh, Verdum is a great. And uh, just one comment quick, because I it would not be myself if I, if I didn't speak about it. But we didn't have the chance to get it. Brian Ortega, man. Oh, yeah. Brian Ortega, man. I know that's your boy. Yeah, man. that's my boy, man. Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, he, I listened to a couple of uh, interviews of him, and he has a real good understanding that a fight starts on your feet. And like he knows that he's good with jujitsu, but he's constantly working on his hands and on his stand-up game because he knows that like he can't just basically be one dimension and just like try to bring somebody down or go on his back and do jujitsu. So I think yeah, he's got a real good mental. He's got a real good understanding of the game, and like arguably, you can say that this guy is probably going to be a world champion one day, or he's gonna he's gonna be fighting for a world championship. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I really appreciate his mentality and the resilience that he shows. Like, again, Frankie was touching him up those first couple minutes, wow. right? Yeah. He he never got discouraged. He he never showed any frustration. And again, like we were saying earlier about connecting with a fighter outside of fighting, he's gone and he started his own foundation to try to help underprivileged kids. So that's something where, you know, I, I want to cheer for that guy. I want that guy to be successful. Oh, yeah. And uh, how, how crazy it is that he killed Frankie, man. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy, man. Like, the... Yeah. The granite chin, cha- Frankie, and yeah, and I, New people, York are tough guys. and people <laughs> won't start knocking Frankie yeah. out now too. No. Like oh. it won't start to happen now. It's just that guy just came through and did that, and that's crazy. Because before the fight, I was saying that I'm more confident that he could submit all the way than Frankie, because. Frankie, man, is awesome wrestler, black belt, and it's not the guy that will get his neck stuck in the guillotine. So now that. He can knock some people out too. That's just yeah. like it's a nightmare matchup for anybody. Oh, he's, he's gonna, gonna be a problem, problem for that whole division. Honestly, there it's gonna be real good. Eh? Again, he's gonna get that. Uh, I think he's gonna get the title shot against. Uh, yeah, yeah, Holloway. He's getting, yeah, he's exactly. Title shot. And like him, or uh, like Holloway or Ortega, like the winner of that, I would love to see it. Uh, like if it's Holloway. I, will, I want that rematch against uh, Conor McGregor. I think Holloway's earned it. You know, oh, yeah, he, he, totally. You know, he's gone through that whole division. He's he's beat Aldo twice, right? And like, you know, it wasn't you know 
as, as much as I respect McGregor, like he he timed that uh, that left hand perfectly, but if they fight a hundred times, that's not how the fight goes, no, right? Exactly. Right. right? Exactly. Um, but Holloway, again, he did the exact same thing he did the first fight. He used his hand. Even worse. He, he, he wore him out and he took him out in the later rounds. So I think Holloway's done everything he needed to do to prove that, you know, he's the best guy in that division. We're going to see what happens with Ortega. But yeah, if he beats Ortega, I'd love to see him fight Conor McGregor again. Oh, yeah. Is, is he going to get the, it? I, I don't know if he if he's got that popularity yet, but you never know. It'd be nice to see. He's the only guy McGregor answers to or takes shots at. On Instagram, Twitter, and stuff, never you hear him talk about Khabib. Never you hear him talk about Tony Ferguson. He talk, doesn't want to talk. When Khabib. Holloway says something or does something, often you see McGregor respond. He's the only guy that he's kind of engaging with in that sense. So that maybe leads me to think that this is the fight that he would want the most, and that's the fight I would want the most too. Yeah, me Let's too. But the two others are just playing scary. <laughs> it's the fight that that's gonna like match up to his style too. <laughs> yeah, that's like, an entertaining fight. You're McGregor. You don't want to fight with Khabib. Nobody oh. wants to fight with Khabib. <laughs> no, nobody <laughs> wants to fight with Khabib, but yeah, you, you don't want to touch that. You know, that's the, yeah, especially uh, like uh, you see uh, Diaz that brought him down and all of that. He started panic wrestling. Blah blah blah. No, you don't like. That's not a good fight for him. Like the Holloway fight, like pretty much his style. You know, they're gonna stand up and have fun and all that. Yeah, they can both show off their skills in that fight. Where again, the Khabib fight. Um, Connor's got to catch him coming in. It's got to be early. He's got to catch him with a hard left and hope that, you know, Khabib can't take it. Whereas with the Holloway fight, you know, he's he's got a chance in round one, two, three, four, or five to beat Holloway. Exactly. But for me, longer it goes, the more it's, go, it's going yeah, Holloway's way. Yeah, uh, he has shown he has great cardio, whereas, you know, McGregor, he needs to take that break in round four or round three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, McGregor will go the distance if he takes a round off. And that's often the time he gets uh, a 10-8 against him. So <laughs> well, he mentioned after the Mayweather fight, he said, you know, there's a point in every fight where I feel like I can't go on, but as soon as I get past that hump, then I can continue and then I can finish off the fight. So, and I don't think you can take that break with Holloway. He, he's going to put no, it on no, you no, with no. volume and those, the, you know, striking. And, you know, even Holloway, you know, his ground game isn't that bad. He, he submitted Cub Swanson, so. No, exactly. But, like, on his feet, he's going to straight up light you up. <rire> yeah. OK, euh, deux affaires en terminant. Question pour toi, ça fait, ça fait une coupe de semaines que je l'ai reçu celle-là, mais je savais qu'on allait souvent savoir Bobby, fait que je me dis que ça serait bon de, que tu répondes à ça quand on allait savoir Bobby, parce que ça a rapport à ça. Euh, toi, dans le fond, après votre combat, euh, Bobby était blessé au bicep, à la main tout. Toi, ça a été annoncé que tu n'allais pas te rebattre dans le tournoi, c'est évidemment. Euh, à cause de syndrome post-commotionnel, nanana. Fait que dans le fond, c'est Nicolas Veilleux, Charlotte Nicolas, man, un des, un des bons listeners. Puis il, il voulait savoir c'était quoi ces syndromes-là. Donc, en d'autres mots, comment tu te sentais est -ce après ce combat-là? Ouais, <rire> ouais c'est pas compliqué, là. C'était une commotion, j'ai joué au football auparavant, pis tout ça. Fait que je savais les, 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 les syndromes. Écoute, j'ai quasiment toutes eu les questions du docteur qui m'a posé. On était où? Je savais qu'on était à saint roch de la je savais la date, je savais tout. À part qu'on était rendu à l'année. L'année, je me suis trompé. J'étais le, oh, en 2015, 2014. Genre, après là, j'ai commencé à croire, ok, ouais. C'est vraiment juste des mal de tête incroyables. T'as pas le goût d'être en lumière pendant une couple de jours. T'as juste, euh, y a des, après deux semaines plus tard, il y a des matins, je l'oubliais, je montais les marches chez nous, euh, un peu rapidement, puis tu le gros mal de tête arrivait. J'ai eu l'équipe qui m'ont vraiment, euh, vraiment bien encadré, ils m'ont évité de faire du jogging pendant un mois, un mois, quasiment une semaine, ils m'ont évité de euh, saut à la corde, tu sais, toutes les choses, j'ai pas eu le coup, j'ai pas, j'ai vraiment appris, il a fallu que je prenne vraiment un break après ce combat-là, parce que sinon, euh, j'aurais euh, probablement euh, endommagé mon menton pour les, 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 les combats euh, précédents. Mais ça, c'est, tu sais, quand ce combat-là a commencé, je me suis bien dit qu'il n'y a aucun de vieux qui allait se rebattre, là. Dans cette, dans ouais, cette ouais, carte là, là. Non, as as soon as your fight started, because you were adver advertised for a tournament, as soon as it started, maybe one or two minutes into the fight, I was looking at it, and I was like, there is no way one of these guys are fighting again tonight. <laughs> like literally no way that cannot happen. So the question was uh, just uh, to um, to tell you, it's one of our, uh, our listeners he asked, was what were the the symptoms Adam had after the fight? Because it was announced that he couldn't participate in the second fight because of. Oh, 
I left the hospital. I left to go to the hospital right after the fight. Yeah, what was crazy, man? <laughs> I, he was in the stands when people were clapping too much. was like that. Uh, yeah, that the and Trump. I knew he was hurt uh, from his end. The, the first time he got canceled because of his end. So I knew he was hurt. And I went to him and I said, Hey, Adam, uh, you went to the hospital. Was it your end? And he looked at me ultra confused. And he told me, no, it's his end. He broke it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was sitting in the hospital and I got word that, you know, uh, you weren't going to be able to continue in the tournament, that you were coming to the hospital too. So I like sat up. I'm like, where is he? I want to go talk to him. I was him. trying to look for you in the hospital. I was like, well, I'll go sit with him and yeah. wait, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had quite the ordeal. There's no one who really spoke English at the hospital. So, uh, oh, in, instead. In Montreal, nobody spoke English. Oh, I, yeah. There was like one doctor that kind of did. So like they, I told him that, you know, my eye was blown up and like, my hand and my arms so they just started like tossing pills at me and they take me in for x-rays and they start pushing my face against the x-ray machine oh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what is going on here right they're like yeah just go back to ontario i'm like all right uh, the, the sad part about that is like like if i if like me i got a concussion if you would have been okay to continue they would have slapped you in the tournament or me yeah. like i believe that Either one of us would have smoked the other guy. I believe so too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's the sad. Yeah, Bobby, man, he, you would have if he, you your end would be okay and you had no injury, they would slap you and you would have won that. And believe me, uh, well, yeah, like, like, like you said, favor, no one was coming out of that fight and doing another one. No, <laughs> exactly. Okay, just finish. Glisse un mot Jean rapidement sur ton linge, man. On est sûr, je chale. Parle-nous de ça rapidement, man. Ouais, ça s'en vient en production. Écoute, ben, ils sont en production, ils sont en train de se faire faire. Je pense que lundi prochain, ou sinon au courant de la semaine, ça sort. Écoute, c'est RS Media. La femme, là, de RS Media, elle a inventé le logo, elle me l'a complètement donné. Je suis tellement content de ça. Pour vrai, il est incroyable. Puis, euh, là, on va, on va faire une petite, une petite euh, line, euh, line de, de clothing. Puis, euh, là, là, pour les gens qui viennent voir les fights, tout ça. Puis, de, du linge casual. Puis, on essaie de, de rendre ça un peu à la, à la mode. Puis, euh, qu'est-ce qui, qu'est-ce qui est cool aujourd'hui, là? Ben, elle a présenté le, pain, le, le panda. Puis, euh, je, on n'a pas encore non, moi je voulais appeler ça Humble. Juste genre comme tu dis linge Humble, mais on va voir là, probablement que le monde autour de moi va un peu décider ces affaires-là. Ah, faut que tu checkes avec les trademarks pis tout et tout, là, c'est ouais, ouais, ultra compliqué avec les trademarks de nos ouais, jours. Ouais, mais là, bon, man. That's it. Quand on va avoir la, 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 le tout, là, bon, on va vous mettre tous les liens dans la description pour ceux qui veulent acheter des chandails au Pado, que ce soit le camo, c'est lui que j'ai, c'est un long tee noir, super beau. Il va y avoir plein d'affaires. Les liens vont être dans la description. And, <laughs> and just to end up, Bobby, if you have anything to say, a shout out to anybody, uh, something uh, on your fight tomorrow, anything, if you want to speak about carrots. Uh... <laughs> yeah, the thing I like about carrots. Uh, so, um, yeah, just thank you to everyone who's supported me and helped me to get here you know it's been a long road long 10 years getting here there's been a lot of people that you know put time and effort into you know making sure that I can live my dreams first of all you know my parents um, any any coaches I've had in the past and um, right now big shout out to my uh, my head coach Jordy Monroe he's here with me this week he's put so much time and effort into this training camp he works so hard for me you wouldn't believe the things he does for me um, you know he's up he's you know in the bathroom cooking for me every night he's he's got he's uh you know got the nutrition down he's uh, doing a fantastic job just you know he, he does so much for me and honestly guys he's he's still a young guy he's uh, got a big run coming up this summer he's uh, d you know don't be surprised to see him in tko before the end of next year he's a fantastic fighter and he he gives me trouble every single day so you know watch <laughs> out 155ers Right. Yeah, man, he's, he's kind of a tall 55er too, man. <laughs> he's large, man. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. He takes me down every day. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a monster. <laughs> so, that <laughs> he's so over quiet. there, like, he's really no, no, no. Side, no, no, no. <laughs> so, that's awesome, man. Once again, Bobby, thank you so much. So I much. appreciate we, it, guys. We wanted to have that talk and whenever you're back in Montreal, is it for a fight, no fight, for any reason, or if we come down to Ontario for the TKO card, just meet up again, do this again, because it was a super talk and we enjoyed it so much and I know for a fact that we can do this for like five hours straight. Yeah, yeah, probably. No, no, if no, we could, like, so... We didn't even prepare nothing. It was like, it was really flowing and all that and that we get to know you a little bit more and then we learned some really interesting, interesting stuff today, like the teacher part and all that, all the sports you did as a young guy and all that and uh, I know uh, we were really 
anxious to get you. Like when we started talking about this, like you were the first name that came up. Like yeah. we gotta have that guy. Like because the, the everybody says you're a gentleman in the sport, and like <laughs> I I I had the chance to, to to see that you're a gentleman too in the sports because I fought you in the like there was respect and all that, and so I said like we gotta get this guy on the on the podcast so he he can show like. Uh, like his real self and like what he likes to do and all that and not all really stoked in there for real anytime man. yeah i really appreciate that you guys have me on i had a great time and uh yeah you guys are doing a really great thing here i hope everyone you know the numbers continue to grow everyone check this out this podcast is amazing yeah. thank you very much so uh come on fait je vais partir à tonne pour que ça <laughs> Thank you very much for taking this time with us. Yeah, you guys are the best. Yes, thank you so much, Bobby.